Welcome everyone to our back to school session on innovative STEM programming. Um, I'm thrilled to hear from four club staff today who are going to share some of the innovative work they've been doing in STEM in their clubs. And so our featured guests and speakers for this session are Jimmy Works, Angela O'Neill, Faraday Johnson, and Don Travius Simmons. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to getting to hear from all of them with you. This is part of our back to school series. And so I just wanna mention in case you haven't heard about some of the new tools designed for back to school on programbasicsplanner.com slash back, you can find a brand new set of school partnership tools, a brand new set of family and caregiver engagement tools, and also a book, uh, a link to book a one-on-one -on -one education consultation. That's a way you can choose a date and a time that works well for you and have a conversation with someone in the youth development department so you can get some personalized support uh, or troubleshooting. All of this is part of an effort um, to, to offer youth-centered learning this back to school season. We know that COVID-19 has had a big impact on learning and education over the last over a year and a half now, and it's still a very relevant part of the education experience for young people and staff and teachers. Um, and so we can, we can rise to the occasion here and be responsive um, by offering youth-centered learning, which is just an overall approach um, and ensuring that flexible learning opportunities and supports are designed around the young people we serve. So designed around their unique strengths and needs and interests and identities. Um, including leading with connection, acknowledging that a lot of young people have experienced trauma and if they have friends that are getting sick, they may still be, um, be grappling with some tough emotions, offering a spectrum of enrichment and support, um, acknowledging that we can help young people build up some of those academic skills and we wanna create those opportunities for them to fall in love with learning, discover a new passion offering relevant and responsive high yield learning activities. We'll hear a lot about those today. Um, engaging deeply with families and caregivers as partners um, in education. Also connecting with schools, since we're, we're working together to create good learning experiences for young people and strong partnerships with schools can make academic success in the club so much stronger. Um, and finally, youth advocacy, finding ways to, to dial into what young people care about and amplify their voices and support them um, to pursue the causes that they, um, that they feel passionate about. So our agenda today, um, we're gonna start by hearing from Jimmy Works with his STEM symposium. Um, we'll hear from Angela O'Neill about interns and STEM ambassadors. Um, from Faraday Johnson about STEM activities that highlight African-American innovators. Um, and then we'll hear via video from Don Travius Simmons um, about creating a STEAM lab in his club. Um, then we'll have time for questions and answers. So if you have questions for the presenters, um, you'll have a chance to ask those, but also this, this can be a conversation about what we're all doing, what we're finding um, to be effective right now in STEM and clubs and troubleshooting any challenges. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Mr. Jimmy Works. Excellent, thanks so much, Chrissy. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Chrissy for the, for the invitation as well. Um, so again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are uh, in the country right now. Um, again, thanks, thanks for this opportunity. Um, so I'm here today to just share a little information about uh, something that I actually started um, about a year ago. Um, it was actually inspired by my work with uh, Columbia University. Um, for three years, we hosted a, uh, a week-long uh, coding camp um, that was uh, in partnership with the uh, National Geographic and Columbia University. So each year they would actually do some sort of a symposium um, that actually kind of, you know, inspired and motivated me to, you know, put something on. And, and the great thing about it, it was virtual. You know, we were on site, um, you know, at National Geographic, but the symposium was virtual. Um, so again, just to provide a little insight, um, symposium is you know simply put a panel of STEM professionals um, that that I've assembled um, over the course of the last year. So um, each event kind of follow follows a, a theme. Um, as you can see, uh, these are a few of the flyers that I have here. Um, themes such as women in STEM, life sciences, technology, architecture, and engineering. Um, 
And you know, the, before COVID, um, you know, the challenge was always, you know, getting uh, STEM professionals to come in person. Um, again, it, it, it rarely occurred. Um, so, you know, oftentimes I will be, you know, facilitating, you know, programming and, you know, it's one thing to, you know, talk about activities, actually do activities, but hearing from my expert means a lot. So, um, you know, COVID, you know, presented a lot of challenges, but um, this was one of the, you know, few blessings that, that came out of it. So simply put the, you know, STEM, the STEM Symposium is a career panel, uh, STEM professionals. And, and the goal of this was to actually provide access uh, to our members. Again, a lot of these people, uh, as you see, Dr. Lonnie Johnson, uh, inventor of the Super Soaker, um, we've had engineers from, uh, you know, Facebook. Um, we've had astronauts. We've had uh, 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 professors from, you know, uh, Ivy League institution, AAAS fellows. So just, just you know, people from all across the country. Um, and, and again, these are people that, you know, our members would probably never have access to. So um, the Sim Sim STEM Symposium, you know, the whole goal of this is to provide that exposure and allow kids to dream and, um, you know, actually see people um, and talk to people who, you know, look like them and, you know, sound like them and, and come from similar backgrounds, which is something that, you know, they typically don't get in schools. Um, so again, our goal was to, you know, kind of bridge that gap and provide that exposure and access um, for our youth. Um, so again, as you see with the flyers, we, since, um, since I guess April of 2020, we've had over 65, uh, Panelists uh, serve on this committee, and and, and again now at, at this point it 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 has some luster to it. You know what I mean? So we're kind of, we're somewhat selective, and you know who we allow to come on. So it's been great. Um, so Chrissy, if you could move on to the next slide. So again, I'm now going to expand on a little bit more about you know what what exactly it is. So again, what is it? It's a panel of STEM professionals. Um, how? So how, how do we do this? So I started with the theme. So, you know, we were, we were actually, um, you know, thinking about, uh, we actually have a virtual platform that we created in response to COVID uh, called Clubhouse at Your House. So we were all thinking about, you know, ways to engage our youth. So, you know, I brought up, oh, maybe you can do a, you know, a STEM symposium. Um, and maybe we have different themes. So um, I kind of use the, the, you know, available resources that we have. Um, again, Boys and Girls Club name does hold some weight. So uh, it was rather easy, uh, you know, getting people to sign on. Um, and again, you know, during this time, you know, we had a lot of volunteers looking to, you know, engage with our youth, but, you know, we were trying to figure out ways, you know, uh, you know, to increase engagement, but, you know, also benefit our youth. So this was one way of doing that. So again, we, we start with the theme. Um, again, uh, I hosted the first uh, STEM symposium over, over the course of four days. So each day we had a theme, we had a woman in STEM, we had health professionals, we had technology. And lastly, we finished up with some environmental science. Um, so in terms of the runner show or the you know, agenda for the, for the symposium, I think um, you know, over the course of the first two that we hosted, um, we found out that you know, it's best to start with some guided questions. Um, this kind of sets the tone for the event. Um, and we then open it up to the audience. Um, so each, each uh, symposium typically runs about an hour. Um, Ideally, you're probably, you, you probably want to have it within that 45 minute range, depending on the size um, of, your, uh, of your cohort of uh, panelists. So ideally, um, we typically had about three to four panelists. Um, this works well. Each panelist got about 10 minutes of, of time. So um, that worked well. And the great thing about it, it's hosted virtually over Zoom. So again, it, it's rather easy to get people to agree to sign on to a Zoom call. Um, so it, 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 it worked well. So. Um, Again, we, we have some guided questions um, and then we kind of open it up to the youth. Um, I, I kind of use this to actually complement programming. So again, in our, at our clubs, we do a lot of engineering, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, coding, um, uh, you know, bioscience, chemistry. So I use it to complement uh, programming and, and it's worked extremely well. Um, so again, the why, um, I kind of expanded on this a little bit earlier, career exposure, um, again, it, 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 I can't explain, I, I, I can't reiterate the, you know, the importance of that career exposure. Again, kids are, you know, the, their brains are still pruning. Again, they're, they're, they're open, they're open books. So, you know, a lot of the times, you know, with, with kids, you know, we'll be doing programming and, oh, I hate this, I hate this. What that really means is they love it. So again, you know, initially kids were, you know, somewhat, you know, 
resistant to it, but you know, over the course of time, man, they've actually grown to love it. Um, and it's something that you know we'll be um, we'll be utilizing, you know, well beyond you know COVID once we get past this phase. Um, but again, it provides that career exposure. It provides that access as well as connections. Um, a lot of the times, you know, a lot of the panelists are actually club kids. Um, and, you know, they're always looking at, looking for ways to, you know, engage with the youth. But also, um, you know, on, I guess on a, on a long-term um, scale, um, it could provide opportunities, um, summer internships, uh, potential jobs. Again, it, again, we try to start kids as early as possible um, with STEM. Um, again, as you all probably know, again, the earlier the better. By the time kids hit middle school, they've, you know, kind of made their mind of, oh, I don't like STEM. So we try to start as early as possible. So um, in terms of an age group, ideally, this, uh, the symposium series would, would probably be best for kids grades three to 12. Um, ideally, we, we, we've utilized it with grades three to eight. Um, but again, it, it's a great way to, you know, provide that, that career exposure, that access, um, and allowing kids to, you know, network and make those connections. Um, I think that's it for me, Chrissy. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your sharing. So we'll be we'll be back with Jimmy in the question and answer panel. So um, any questions you have about the STEM symposium, hold on to those. And in the meantime, um, I'm glad to introduce Angela O'Neill. Good morning, everybody. I am so sorry that I was running late this morning. We actually had another training starting in the building, exact same time. So I was trying to do two things at once, as I'm sure all of you can relate to. <laughs> so, um, so I've uh, wanted to talk a little bit about our staffing model that we tried out this year in STEM. Um, and uh, this, this slide right here just has some pictures of the past summer. We were actually just finished up our summer program uh, as of Friday. And our school starts on Wednesday. So we actually have a really quick turnaround when it comes to summer and fall, like I think most of you people are. So we started a pilot programming and staffing in STEM this summer here at Boys and Girls Club of North Alabama. Chrissy, can you switch to the next slide for me? Thank you. So we had a problem in our STEM program and nobody likes to talk and say, oh gosh, I've got a problem, but we really did have a problem. We have a lot of STEM equipment and STEM facilities and lab spaces, and that was going really, really well for our organization. But training and retaining high quality STEM staff was very difficult, especially across 11 locations. So with the support of my CEO, uh, we tried a different type of staffing model this summer and it's worked pretty well for us. So instead of having a STEM director or STEM person that is uh, based at a single club, we've actually have interns and assistants that work across the entire organization. So what we did was, and they're paid, um, they are paid through the regular operations of the club. And the assistants were actually middle school students that were paid via a sponsor, local sponsorships at the club level. So what we did was we actually um, recruited um, college interns using a website called Handshake. It is specifically for college students to find work study programs and work and things like that. It's used by most colleges in the United States. And we gave, I was overwhelmed with response of college students from local colleges that wanted to work with us. I had two positions open for the summer. I had almost 20 applicants that were all qualified, which is pretty awesome, especially right now with the hiring practices and everybody's trying to find people to find uh, college students were was really excited about it. So that was managed, uh, the program was managed completely from the corporate level instead of the club level. So what that means is that our schedules were managed by me, their lesson plans were managed by me, and they were then scheduled to go out to different clubs based on their availability and what the clubs needed as far as the amount of days per week that a STEM person would be at a club. Uh, what that allowed us to do was to schedule programming based on expertise. And for what I mean by that is if I have, um, so if you look at the picture up in the corner there, there's our two interns that we had this summer, Ishmael and Sloan. Sloan is a senior biology student and Ishmael is a senior computer engineering student. So 
I was giving Sloan all of the biology chemistry classes and Ishmael had all the computer science and robotics classes. He has experience on robotics teams nationally because that's what he did in high school. So they were they worked really well. In addition, we also had two assistants that worked with this program. Um, they are in the other corner. That's our two middle schoolers that we had that piloted this program. Um, I'm slightly biased. One of them is my child. Uh, so, um, and then we also had another middle school student and they were also scheduled to be in class based on where the needs were in the organization. So every day they were in different locations. Um, their parents were very nice and dropped them off wherever they needed to be. And then they were paid weekly. Um, they actually were paid $100 a week to do the programs. So They're working about 20 hours a week, each one of them, helping out in the STEM program and giving them some really good job experience as well. Uh, and then finally, the thing that I wanna also say is that we also had um, a, quite a bit of meetings and trainings with these guys as well. They did about 15 hours of training, everybody before they set foot with kids. Um, all these guys had technical expertise, but not necessarily a whole lot of child development training. So that was something that we used. We used a variety of UGCA resources, resources from Click to Science, where I used a lot of those, and then just stuff from myself as well. And then finally, we had a tag up meeting with the staff every week to go over exactly what worked, what didn't, how's everybody doing, uh, why is that crazy child, that is it, are they crazy for you? Yes, they're crazy for me too. Ooh, let's talk about how we can help each other out with that. So it definitely kind of, even though we had different staff at places, different days, they would see the same types of kids. So it was really useful. Um, it has been well received by my management, my CEO. So I'm actually right now getting to reload. Um, both of my interns wanna do another semester. So I'm really excited about that. Their schedules are a little bit tricky. Uh, so we'll try that out. And then I'm being hired two more. So we're going to definitely scale up with this. So that was something that we did this summer that we had a high degree of success in with our STEM program. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, so again, we'll have you back for the question and answer panel in a moment. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'm excited to introduce Faraday Johnson. Hello everyone, my name is Faraday, as Ms. Chrissy just said. I am a STEM ambassador for the University of Memphis and I'm also a STEM mentor at the Boys and Girls Club. First, I'd like to describe some of the activities that we're do we were doing in some of these pictures. Uh, in the top left corner, we were making a catapult. It is really fun with STEM activities. I like to make them creative and I like to use engineering a lot because I'm majoring in biomedical engineering. Um, in the uh, bottom left, we have a, um, a bow and arrow, and we actually had a game. I set up a, a dartboard, a dartboard, but it was not really a dartboard, and we shot straws at it, and it was a fun comp uh, competition to have in my classroom. In the middle here, we, um, we made a lava lamp, and the students, uh, they actually, they absolutely loved that. We also did the bouncy egg challenge. The egg exploded, but it was still fun. <laughs> it was cracked, so that's how it exploded. Don't have a cracked egg when you do that challenge. And at the top here, we have a, uh, we did a present well, activity on Mae Jemison. She was one of the, well, she was actually the first African-American astronaut and well, female astronaut, and we did activity with her. We, and you see, we made rocket ships, and that's actually what I'll be talking about in the next slide. Can you? Uh... All right. So as you can see, these are all the um, the rocket ships that we made. Yeah, egg explosions are super fun. <laughs> um, so. This activity is great for visual, auditory, and physical learners because you'll be watching videos, you'll be doing hands-on ex experiments, and you'll also be listening. So for my experiments, well, actually for my activities, I like to go on Word and I like to write out questions. And I also like to use YouTube. So when students are 
listening to a video or watching, they know what to listen for. They know what facts to write down and they just know what to do. And also when kids get off task, that'll keep them listening and that, that'll keep that from happening. Um, this project was on May Jemison, as I said, and it's an estimated time about four, 45 minutes. And the first steps that I do when conducting these activities are I do a short overview. So what that means is I ask them uh, basically, do you know who the first African-American woman was to fly in space? And uh, to your, um, you really, a lot of people, you might know who that is, but students, they don't. And many known people, well-known people like Harriet Tubman, I introduced to the students and they, they didn't know who she was. So these activities that you think that are well-known people, your students might not know who they are. So with Mae Jemison, I did that first. And on the second part, the second step of each activity, I do fun facts slash YouTube videos. So this is where I write out questions for them to do. Well, I'll already have them written out and printed off so that when we follow along with the videos, they know what to look for, what to write down, because at the end, they have to write at least three facts they write from um, up to three to five facts about that person so that it'll be in their long-term memory when they think back. And when they get to school, they could tell their teacher, oh, I know this person, that's Mae Jemison. And they could brag about knowing her and that they were taught that at the Boys and Girls Club. And uh, Chrissy, can you play the video? This is an example of what- Maybe. Lock the door and turn the lights down low. Is that a YouTube video? <laughs> I like that song though. Going into space has to be amazing and many have done this throughout history. But do you know who the first African-American woman to go into space is? Join me as I share a few fun facts about Dr. May C. Jemison, the first African-American woman to enter space. Dr. May C. Jemison is an American engineer, physician, and NASA astronaut born October 17, 1956 in Decatur, Alabama. Growing up, May was the youngest child of her parents, Charlie and Dorothy Jemison. Her father was a carpenter and her mother was a teacher. In school, May was always encouraged by her family and she did very well earning a scholarship and attending Stanford University. May also enjoyed dance, theater production, and participated in her Black Student Union. May would go on to earn her degree in chemical engineering and later would earn her medical degree working as a general practitioner. Another cool thing May C. Jemison did was work with the Peace Corps as a medical officer teaching and doing medical research. Wanting to pursue her dreams, May would change careers and applied for admission to NASA's astronaut training program. This would be tough with thousands of people trying to get in. Being the first is always a challenge and one of the first that May is known for becoming the first African-American woman to be admitted into the astronaut training program on June 4th, 1987. After many years of hard work, May C. Jemison would see her dreams of going into space come true on September 12, 1992, when she went into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor with six other astronauts. May C. Jemison would go on to teach, establish the Jemison Group, and more. So it just goes to show all things are possible when chasing your dreams. And those are fun facts, a biography on Dr. May C. Jemison. So I showed you, well, Miss Christie showed you that video because this is an example of what an activity would be like. It would last 45 minutes. This is a short two minute video, but the activity, um, it takes a long time to make that rocket ship. So um, can we go back to the PowerPoint slide? Thank you. And um, I know students are really good with YouTube. 
when they see things, that's when they'll remember it. And seeing things and listening at the same time, it's, um, it's great for their long-term memory. So the next part would be arts and crafts arts and crafts. This would be the longest part of the activity. And it's really fun. And they actually have to write down, as I said, three to five facts about Mae Jemison. Can any of y'all state one fact that you learned from the video? Just one. I need one person. <laughs> Feel free to go off of uh, mute or write it in the comments. Yes, she was the first black female astronaut. Thank you. All right, so. I just wanted to add, I never knew she was a doctor, a medical doctor. I just assumed it was a PhD. I didn't know that day. either. I didn't know that either, that's amazing. She um she majored in chemical engineering. She was a doctor and an astronaut. She was all three at once. Wasn't that amazing? Like I had no idea. And that just goes to show like, it doesn't matter and that's what I try to teach the students. That doesn't matter where you start out, but where you finish, because you could achieve your goals. And through these um, highlighting African-American innovators teaches students that. And I love to end my activities with a Kahoot. High school students love Kahoot and elementary students love Kahoot. This is an activity you could do with any age. I love it myself. And it'll go in their long-term memory because they're actually applying um, these facts and it'll um, they'll learn more about the person. So now I would like to go into the TikTok video to show y'all how to make this rocket ship. And it is one that I made. Thank you. So I believe in the power of TikTok all of these students are on TikTok right now and social media. So they will see that hopefully on their feed one day, hopefully soon. And it's just something that all students use. So I think connecting with younger students, finding ways to connect with them uh, allows them to learn more and to be more interested in STEM. All right, I'm next for, I'm ready for the next um, slide. <laughs> All right, so the next activity is about Garrett Morgan. He invented the three position traffic signal. And this activity would last about 30 minutes. And I would start again with a short overview. And then I would go into a YouTube video. So what I'm saying, like this is the same process that I do every single time. So they, this gives you ideas of what you can do in your own classroom. You could, um, I have a, a link on the next slide that shows a hundred innovators that you can find of, of black people who are inspiring and that will be inspirations to the, the next generation. Oh, it's, a, it's under a hundred black innovators. I also have a STEM link, STEM inventions that I found that um, helped me make the catapults and the bow and arrow, that would be great for y'all. And Kahoot, it's a valuable resource and it's fun. And can I go back to the last slide? <laughs> Sorry, all right. So it would be the video, it's two minutes. So if you had a long video, I played one for my students. It was about Percy LeVon Julian. He made probably about 300 different inventions with paints and different stuff. He's an amazing person. And he's my favorite scientist. Um, and since we had a long video, it's, it's easy to lose attention in their attention spans. So this is when you would make a Word document and you would list questions for students to listen to or answers like to listen for during the video so that they'd stay on task. 
and we would end this with the arts and craft activity. And this is the next TikTok video where we did the three position traffic signal. As you can uh, see, I have that same process every time if you want to take notes. I, um, for conducting acti the activity, I do a short overview, a fun fact slash YouTube video, and they will always have to write those facts on the activity. It's like an arts and crafts slash STEM activity. And Kahoot, Kahoot is necessary for retention. Uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Faraday. We'll be back with you for questions in just a moment. Um, and our final um, STEM innovator is not with us live, but um, he recorded this video yesterday. And so I'm gonna share this video from Don Travius Simmons talking about setting up a STEAM lab in their club. The team director at the bottom All right, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Duntravia Simmons. I am the team director at the Bob Mackey Teen Center, part of the Boys and Girls Club of North Central Georgia. And today I just wanted to share a few minutes about uh, our Novella STEM lab that we have here um, inside of all six locations um, here at our Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Novellas is a STEM company um, that high, stands on the hinges of uh, computer designing. Um, they do 3D designing for computers and programs. Um, so if you take a look at some of the pictures in the background, especially with the blue walls um, and students sitting in the background, you'll be able to see that Novellus provided for us um, a computer system where they do 3D projects on for STEM. And so through Novellus, they actually furnish these computers for us. They furnish these STEM equipment for us. Um, they come to our club, as you can see in the slide before, they come to our club, they help assist with STEM projects. Um, they bring the resources that's needed. And so inside of this lab here, um, I keep going back to that 3D computer because it's very neat. Um, you all should look into it as well. Part of what they do is uh, with this 3D computer, our kids, are able to take a human heart. Let's use for exam as example, human anatomy. So with this program, they're able to pull up that uh, human heart onto the TV screen you see in the back. They're able to go through what 3D glasses in the pen and actually go through different parts of the heart, hearing the blood flow through the heart, hearing the heart beat. And so these things have been tested and proven and sparked the interest of our club members through our NYOI results and even through um, our uh, power, power Hour time where students are doing um, science and STEM programming activities. And so part of what we cover inside of our Novellus Lab is coding. Um, so we partner with Nike corporate office and providing coding experiences for our club members um, on the level that they know best of shoe designing. Uh, we always doing my future. So every day kids come into our computer lab, they have on their information on my future about what STEM project we're gonna do for the month or what STEM projects we're gonna do for the week. We also have Girls Who Code group. And so with our Girls Who Code group, you can see them working in some of the pictures here um, where they are actually building projects. They are working through sessions. They have their own little Girls Code group uh, where they meet weekly. 
Um, and so the novellas group comes in and help with our girls who code and mentor these people. Um, some cool things have sparked out of um, our STEM lab is the Lego League competition, robotics, um, our drone programming. So students who are part of our club can also gain certification in drone programming, robotics. And the good thing about it is we're adding on this school year aviation. And so these students compete with other clubs. These students compete with their classmates. And so we take those students who um, aren't able to make the robotics team at their school, to make the Lego leaks at their school, and get them to be a part of our club. And so through that whole process, these students record, they track their progress, they take pictures, they write up reports, they create e-portfolios to show how they are improving in their skills and how the setting of science inside of the school classroom is much different than what they have inside of the club. And so I charge every organization, I charge every person that's listening, hey, find out what STEM companies are close by you, whether it's Procter & Gamble, who also helps take our kids on tours. And so through Procter & Gamble, our students are able to get a day-to-day -day hands on experience. And then one of the other neat things that I'll leave you with is this here. Through Amazon, we are able to do the virtual Amazon tour of the Fulfillment Center. And we do it in our Novellus Lab. And so Amazon, in return, sets up a time for us to connect with one of their Fulfillment Center representatives and team members. And so we get a chance to not only just see it through a 3D lens, but we also get a chance to hear it from the experts themselves. And so this experience here inside of these STEM labs have really caused for our students, number one, to graduate in science, improving their scores by 81% from C's all the way to A's and B's. The second thing that we're proud to brag about is that girls who participate in this program have shown the interest. And so now we have other organizations that are coming along and saying, hey, we want to work with your girls and get them more involved in the STEM and medical industry. And then lastly, I say for our competition programs, hey, the gym has been shut down on certain days just so the robotics and drone and Lego leagues can transform from playing basketball to exploring the possibilities of what it means to actually uh, compete and to build a Lego competition platform. And so uh, if there's any questions, I'm all here for answers and you all can reach out to me at dsimmons at bgcncg.com. So thank you for this opportunity to share. All right, so I did want to highlight a few of the links that um, relate to some of the content that Don Travius brought up before we go into our question and answer panel. Um, if you're interested in the drone program that he mentioned, this is the link that they've used to get started with drones. Um, first Lego League is a wonderful way to get into robotics. Um, and if anyone has questions about that, um, I know Susan on the line is a great champion for, for robotics and for FIRST. Um, Girls Who Code, if you're not familiar, syncs pretty well with the computer science pathway that Boys and Girls Clubs of America has, but is a, a great way to specifically engage girls in coding. And then um, if you're interested in that Amazon Future Engineer, the tour of the fulfill Fulfillment Center, you can either focus on computer science um, or, or a different focus. And so there's the link there. Um, so with that, I want to welcome everybody back um, on our panel and invite you all to ask any questions you have for our panelists. If you've got questions about the STEM symposium, about STEM interns and assistants, about um, really thoughtfully integrating and highlighting African-American innovators into STEM projects um, and, and using TikTok to teach STEM, um, or if you have questions about the STEAM lab. So what questions do you all have for this group?
I might ask one to, to kick us off as um, you're welcome to type your questions in the chat or come off mute, but just to get things started. Um, Jimmy, I'm curious, as you're setting up these events in the STEM symposium, some professionals are just naturally better at talking to youth than others. How do you prepare your speakers before they're going to present um, for the STEM symposium? And then how do you prepare youth before the symposium? Do you do, you do any like prep work with them before the symposium starts? Yeah, excellent question, Kristen. So yes, there's a lot of prep work that goes into it. So typically I meet with the uh, with the panelists, maybe about a week or two uh, in advance. Um, I also give them guided questions. So, you know, they know what questions they're gonna be asked. And in terms of the youth, um, just, just going over, you know, general uh, etiquette, um, you know, being respectful um, and it's worked really well, but um, there, there is some prep that goes into it. Um, but it, it works best, um, you know, when you have some guided questions and they know, you know, the questions that they're gonna ask. Um, so they come prepared. So it hasn't really been an issue. Um, but there, there, there is a lot of prep that goes into it, but it, it's definitely worth it. I'm sure, yeah. Um, that's the kind of thing that to, to get to the main event, there's a lot leading up to it, I know. Um, I can keep asking questions, but if anyone else has questions, I don't wanna, um, don't wanna take over. Okay, I'll also throw in there, um, and this is a question for anyone, I think related to um, several of uh, the opportunities you've mentioned, it's sort of building in career exploration, building in some history, like incorporating multiple components into STEM. So whether you're building activities around historical figures or making sure to highlight um, current professionals in the STEM field. Um, just wanna ask you all for any lessons learned about how do you make those things work together? How do you sort of bring together STEM and workforce readiness um, in a way that's been really effective in your club? Um, I can go. Uh, so when, we, when I hired the interns and the assistants, um, one of the things I was really looking for, obviously, was for diversity and to make sure that they match the population that they were going to be working with. Um, because, like, research says that if you don't have a role, you can't dream a dream you've never seen. So it was really important to me that I had women, I had people of color, I had kids that were from their own club to kind of say as a role model, like, yeah, you can like STEM. And I think that everybody, you know, who I'm obviously very biased, but I mean, if you're alive, you think drones are cool. You think robots are cool, right? Like no one's going to say, oh, those are lame. Like no one's saying that. But if you don't have the self-efficacy to say, ah, oh, you know what, I'm good at that. And then I can go do it. If you've never seen anybody who looks like you, if you've never seen someone who's in those fields, then you're not going to think it's for you. Um, we did some surveys with our kids before we started about like what stereotypes they have about scientists and engineers, and many of them still don't see themselves in these fields. So until we start putting more people in front of them that do these things, we're not really going to get any far. So I think putting that career element in there in all the ways that have been presented this morning is really, really important so that those kids can start to internalize that, yeah, I can do this because I see that person doing it and I see that person doing it and I see someone in my club doing it too. So that's what just my 25 cents worth. I believe Almenia has a question for me, so I'll go ahead and respond. Um, so how do you get the children to engage in questions? Um, in general, they tend to be shy. So for me, um, again, it's all about uh, applicability. So again, I'm not putting, uh, you know, I'm not putting people in front of them um, that, you know, they aren't familiar with in terms of content. So again, everything that I do complements programming. So, you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, space. We talk a little bit about chemistry. So the kids already have insight. Um, and again, uh, the guided question kind of, it kind of takes the edge off of things. Um, so that always helps, but um, just, you know, just to reiterate that. So every, you know, every, every theme or every, you know, professional that I put in front of them, the kids do have some insight into, you know, what their, what specific career or, they have some, they have a touch point. Um, again, I, I use it to complement programming. Um, just, just to address that question. 
I'll answer Susan's question. It was Faraday, did you do focus sessions for girls? And I have not yet. So my third through fifth grade class was just boys. It was all boys. And um, I didn't have the chance to do that, but I would be interested in that. I am a part of the Girls Experience and Engineering program at the University of Memphis, where it's nothing but girls and we help them work with um, connects, make cars, um, uh, work with uh, buildings and how to make buildings earthquake resistant. So I have worked with girls in that regard, but not at the Boys and Girls Club yet. Thanks, Angela, there's a question for you in the chat. Yeah, okay. so I see the question was about like, how did the interns interact with the staff that was already in the club? Um, as with everything in the Boys and Girls Club, uh, yes, both. Uh, it just kind of depended on the site that we were going to and the size of the site that we were going to. So we have quite a wide variety of sites. So some of our ADAs are 30 kids, some of them are 300 kids. So when we had went to larger sites, then the YDP would be staying in the room with us and they would be helping alongside, which kind of gave us an extra little benefit of uh, professional development especially when I was out teaching at sites because I was part of the rotation. So I taught at all the sites as well. Um, that was kind of nice. I wasn't expecting that. That was kind of a little like bonus where they got to see me teach. And if they didn't have a lot of experience teaching, they'd see like, oh, I see how you did that. Or, hey, why'd you do it this way? And which was nice um, at some of our smaller sites than we would be by ourselves. It just kind of depended. Um, we did rotate. We weren't in pods. Um, just because our transmission levels at the time were not so bad. Yeah, that leads me to, to wanna ask about um, this upcoming back to school season. As you think about your hopes and plans for STEM programming, um, are there any things that you could imagine tweaking um, based on how COVID and the Delta variant kind of um, change over the past couple weeks? Are there are there things that you know you would switch to virtual or things you know you would switch to outside or anything you're thinking about um, just sort of with contingency planning in the next couple weeks or months? And that's a question for anyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, Christy. So, so for us, we've been completely virtual uh, since um, April of 2020. Um, you know, we've we've learned a lot. We, we you know, I've, I've gotten an opportunity to pilot a lot of things. Um, you know, just to provide a little insight, uh, our summer camp, uh, STEM, STEM, STEM summer camp, you know, has, has started in June. We've actually reached over uh, 350 kids, and it's you know completely virtual. Obviously, you know, there are limitations. Um, and to be honest, it's a lot more work. Um, we actually have to utilize uh, prepackaged kits. So as long as we get the kits out, um, you know, we you know we set the schedules up. It's been pretty seamless. Um, so, you know, I, I, ideally we would love to be in person, but um, you know, the virtual uh, you know environment ha has allowed us to reach you know more clubs. Um, you know, from the from the comforts of my home. You know, I can you know do a STEM session. I can get you know six to seven clubs to sign on at once. Whereas, you know, before COVID, you know, I was at one club a day, 15 kids. So, I mean, it, it, again, it, 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 there are barriers, um, but I think, you know, um, the virtual, uh, you know, format allows us, you know, to reach more kids. Um, obviously there, there are barriers, um, but at the same time, um, I think it's just all about being flexible. Um, again, it makes, you know, being in person that much easier. If you can do it virtually, you can definitely do it in person. So. Uh, that's all I have for that question, Chris. Thanks. Can you repeat the question? I'm just curious um, if you have any plans for how your STEM programming might shift in the next couple of weeks or months, depending on what happens with um, the COVID Delta variant. Um, I know if you're reaching young people through TikTok, that works no matter what, whether they're at home or in the club or anywhere. Um, so just curious about how you're thinking about being nimble in the next couple weeks and months? I was thinking through Zoom too. Uh, Zoom, it's, it was, I've never heard of it before 
COVID, never. And it's helped reach a lot of students like Jimmy was saying. And through Instagram, videos on Instagram, there is a place where you could post long videos now. And I think it gets a lot of attention also through, um, well, since COVID, we've, we've been in person this whole time, yeah. So I think we'll go back to being in person when, um, when fall starts because we're in Tennessee now, so. Thanks, y'all. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to, to chime in, or if you want to put them in the chat, we can always come back to a question. Um, while you're thinking about any last questions you want to ask our presenters, um, I just want to share a couple of quick things about some of the resources that are available for STEM programming. Um, in the programming space, we've got traditional programs that are you know, designed to be facilitated in person, like Summer Brain Games, some Summer Brain Games STEM, DIY STEM, Ultimate Journey, lots of MyFuture.net programs, um, which could work in a virtual context or an in-person context, um, including computer science, digital literacy, um, some great DIY STEM activities on My Future, if you haven't seen those, um, as well as media making, if you have youth interested in digital arts um, and things like web design or 3D printing. Um, and Summer Brain Gain and Ultimate Journey have components on my future as well. So that's where you could go to get some activities and programs if you're looking for more ideas of the types of things you could offer youth. In the professional development realm, um, the education learning pathway is one place you can look for a quick reference of all the trainings that are recommended for educators, um, but specifically for STEM focused staff or STEM focused interns um, or assistants, some of the trainings that we would call out as being really helpful are active learning, that's one of my favorites, hands on learning, cultural responsiveness and inclusion. Um, on the 201 level, STEM in the club is a great training, which traditionally was just an in-person training, and now it's available on demand on Spillette as well. Um, some other great STEM specific trainings, and then um, for any specific program that you wanna facilitate, there's a training for that as well. Um, in the realm of just capacity building overall, um, just wanna make sure if you haven't heard of these resources before that you know on bgca.net slash STEM, you can find an everything STEM planning guide, um, which is designed to be everything STEM with an assessment for continuous quality improvement, a planning guide, some tools and templates. There's also a STEM space center, center space redesign guide if you have an opportunity to kind of remodel or remake a room that you're gonna use for STEM. Um, also, because doing great STEM um, can cost money. Uh, this is a, a resource for a funding template that you could use to pursue funders in your area and ask them to support your STEM programming in a really drag and drop um, templated way so that you don't have to start from scratch with a proposal or a pitch deck or anything like that. Um, did want to call out that uh, if we're trying to focus on being relevant in STEM, um, the Smithsonian Institute has some great developmentally appropriate resources about vaccines and about the coronavirus, especially as the age um, of vaccinations getting younger. You know, right now, youth who are, who are over 12 are eligible um, and, and researchers are still working on the R&D for, for pediatric vaccines. So super relevant conversation to have with your youth in STEM programming. Um, and also, if you at your club are interested in setting up a vaccine clinic or you're interested in setting up a vaccine education program, um, send me an email and I'll connect you to someone who can offer some great support and also some great incentives um, to support that. So one more way to, to be super relevant and STEM oriented uh, during this season. Um, I'm going to leave up this page for a minute with with some ways that you could follow up if you wanted to book a consultation, join the education learning community or find a training on the STEM pathway. Um, but did wanna do one last call for any questions. Um, thanks Susan for calling out. There's about to be a great DIY STEM contest on my future. So a couple weeks from now um, and you can get individual STEM kits that support the activities on my future. Um, so instead of just getting the giant supply kit for DIY STEM for your whole club, you can get some individualized kits that would work for virtual or hybrid 
um, or in-person instruction. Anyone want to share one last question before we go? All right. Well, if not, um, I want to say thank you so much, Jimmy and Faraday and Angela, and thanks to Don Travius for joining yesterday. Um, it's so exciting to get to hear what you're doing and really appreciate you taking the time to share the work that you've been doing in STEM um, with the rest of us. So thanks for your time and for your expertise. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Good to see you. And Faraday, I just want to let you know I was super excited.